David Solomon, chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs. So much to discuss with you about what's happening in Davos, of course, but really what's happening in Wall Street and the larger economy. But I want to start with the firm first, which is what is happening? And I think there were a lot of questions that were raised uh, around what took place on the earnings call yesterday, where you think this is all headed. And maybe just we can start with just the lessons of Marcus to some degree, because I think a lot of people have focused, obviously, on that. Not to say that that's the future of the company, because it isn't anymore, but to the extent that there were lessons in that, and people are focused on trying to understand what you understood now about it. Okay. Well, there's a lot there. And first of all, thank you for having me. I'm I'm glad to be here. Um, We obviously had a disappointing quarter, and we tried to own that, you know, up front. I think the thing that's interesting is there has been a lot of focus on the investments we've made in serving consumers and the platforms. Um, As you know, we narrowed those. Right. But I think in the context of the quarter, and there was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal this morning, the thing that really affected the quarter and the year is that we have a very balance sheet intensive asset management business. And three years ago, when we laid out our strategy in Investor Day, we said we wanted to reduce that because it created a lot of volatility. And we've been reducing that in periods of easy money. And particularly during the pandemic, one of the reasons we so outperformed in 2021 was because of that balance sheet. If you look at 2021, our ROE outperformed the peer average in 2021 by 900 basis points. And so, obviously, in a year where, the, for the first time in 50 years, fixed income markets and equity markets are down, the S&P is down 20, the Nasdaq's down 30, you unwound a, both of a, a bunch of that. And our business mix, because we have almost a third of our capital right. you know, attributed to this, was more affected. And so, you know, we wound up, I think, with reasonable performance for the year, better than 10% ROE. But what I'd really, what I'm focused on is three years ago, we laid out a strategy to grow our banking and markets businesses. We've grown them. We've taken market share. Those are leaders. You can look at the relative performance through 2022. Look at the ROE for those businesses against who we're peered with. Those are leading businesses. It's part of our core. Our asset management business, we're executing on our strategy. We're reducing the balance sheet. If you actually look under the numbers and you can see them now in our new disclosure, our relative asset growth and the performance of the core business is actually quite good when you stand it up against peers. So we're raising a lot of money, serving clients, growing that. There's a lot of opportunity for us in the asset management business. Now, in the consumer platforms, you know, we did some things right. We didn't execute on some others. I think, and I said this on the earnings call yesterday, we probably took on more than we should have, you know, too much too quickly. But I think we now have a very good deposits business, We're working on our cards platform, and I think the partnership with Apple is going to pay meaningful dividends for the firm over time. We have this acquisition of Green Sky. We think it's a good business. And so we're going to give people a clearer view. There's more transparency around how they can contribute. But everybody's focused on its 3 percent of our revenues, and we're very focused. By the way, I would tell you, I spoke to a number of investors yesterday who think that the stock is actually holding up quite well. I don't know if you agree with that. But but as a result of the fact, frankly, that it is a small part of the business. And, and you have a Goldman premium. I'm just wondering, what's book now? It's, it's under 300. Is uh, no, book's over 300. It, book's it, over three, slightly over 300. Slightly over three. Slightly so over you had 350. I think, just, I, I think three is it a, three. Some people just shooting the, the breeze last night. I think 300 is a great spot for it because maybe the Goldman premium isn't what it used to be. Well, I, 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 I would tell you that if you look at 97% of our business, you know, 75% of it last year, rough numbers, was on our banking and markets business. It is a world-class franchise. It had an over 16% ROE for that business. We have no corporate center. That's a true ROE. GE at one point had a a multiple that was so out of line with what any company like that should have had because never missed, never missed, never missed. Joe, we trade at nine times earnings. Right. You know, I think we've done well for our shareholders. Over the last Over the last three years since our investor day, we've grown our book value per share by 40%. The next nearest competitor is approximately 20%, half that. This past year, look, some bumps this year, no question. We grew our book value per share by 7%. Next closest competitor, 3%. A bunch of large financial institutions, zero. So we're focused on executing our strategy. We made a lot of progress over the last few years. We got more to do, but I think the firm's incredibly well positioned. And we have a business mix that's very sensitive to capital markets activity and asset prices. We're trying to evolve that, but we still have a distance to go, and we're, we're working on it. Speak to the job cuts, though, because obviously that's made a lot of headlines recently. Well, it, 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 um, it has made a lot of headlines. And, you know, I understand, you know, to some degree, it's, it's a difficult decision to do a job cut like that. And I'll, I'll tell you just honestly, we struggled with it. 
Um, I feel enormously for the people that were affected by it. But we've grown the firm substantively. If you go look at the revenues of the firm over the last three years compared to the revenues before, the balance sheet, the capital, we've grown it materially, and we materially grew our headcount. But during the pandemic for two and a half years, we stopped the normal process of reviewing underperformers for two and a half years. The environment's changed, and we made the difficult decision, and it's kind of a reset, and I think it was the right decision, and it positions us very well as we go forward, as we see the environment forward. So I, I, I hate the fact we had to do it, but given how we've grown the firm and the headcount was the right decision to do. The Financial Times has reported that basically everything at the firm is under review, spending on just about everything. Is that, is that accurate? I, I, I think that's, that's, that's a little bit of an overstatement. We're always focused on expenses. We're always managing the firm. You know, we're running our normal process. Again, if you, if you step back, okay, I don't think what we saw in the asset management business and the balance sheet in 2020, the second half of 2020 and 2021 was normal when everything inflated. By the way, I don't think it was normal in 2022 when both fixed income and equity markets were down. S&P down 20, NASDAQ down 30. If we have another year where the S&P is down 20 and NASDAQ's down 30 and fixed income and equity markets are down, you know, that will be tough given our business mix, but that's not the way the year is starting off, and that's not what, what I expect. What do we deserve? Sure. What do we deserve in terms of when do we get synchronized fixed income and stock markets again? Could it be this year? Could it be and next year? It goes year? back to the 60-40 question. Or, or, is there, or is there more pain? Do we not deserve it yet? I, I think what's interesting, Joe, is the, the, the macro psyche, um, I think, is evolving or breaking a little bit more to the positive. You know, certainly the first few weeks of the year were a little bit more risk on you know, in terms of yeah. activity broadly. I know you guys would agree with that. Um, you know, if you look at, and I think this, I just got here this morning, and so I haven't had a chance to go through, you know, 15 or 20 meetings. I've got 30 over the next two days with clients, see a lot of clients. I think the sentiment is softening a little bit, and the view that the chance of a softer landing, um, both in the U.S. and Europe, is actually increasing. Our economists, you know, our economics team has been pretty soft landing over the last six months. I was more in a position because I was talking to CEOs who have been more cautious that I was more uncertain. But I see CEOs softening a little bit. And, you know, our economics team, even last weekend, went and said that they now are not calling for recession in Europe. The improvement in the energy situation, mm -hmm. the reopening in China, you know, they actually see as a little bit more positive. So I think the distribution where we have, you know, a softer situation, it's still out of consensus. But... You know, I think you're going to hear more of that here over the next couple of days. And if we continue, you know, as we are, I think the chance of that, you know, may grow as we go through you the year. you trust the Fed? Are they in love with being, being tough and doing what needs to be done? And I, they, I, they don't know when to declare victory? And, and I think the Fed, I think the Fed's going to look at the data. And I think the Fed's going to do what it needs to do. I think there's a stronger point of view that inflation in the U.S. has peaked. I think we'll have to watch the data very closely and what the trajectory is here. But certainly the last reading or two would endorse that view. If that continues, you know, I think as we get through the first half of the year, we'll see some different messages, but we'll have to see. Uh, I just want to go back to Goldman for a second. The investment bank has been very, very strong, it continues to be strong. I just want to know where, and you mentioned Apple before and the credit cards. I want to understand where you think that fits in the whole matrix long term, if it does, and how the wealth management piece of Goldman you think evolves or doesn't. Well, we're growing our wealth management right. business very, very nicely. As you know, Andrew, and we've talked about it before, um, you know, if you go back five years ago, we really only managed wealth for a very, very small number of uber, uber wealthy individuals. That business is a, a, a great business. That we're a leader in that space. But Goldman Sachs is a big and aspirational brand and a big global footprint. There are lots of wealthy people that have assets to invest. We obviously have a big, big platform. And so we've done a number of things to grow that. I think that will continue to grow. You know, our partnership with Apple, one of the things that I think is interesting about it, it's one of the big ecosystems um, that, that people are on around the world. And as digital connectivity allows, you know, the banking system right. to be more connected to these platforms, it's an interesting potential deposit source. Um, you know, we announced something with Apple that's not out yet but will be coming out that allows people to take their Apple cash and put it inside Goldman Sachs. And so I think it's an interesting opportunity for us to experiment and do some different things. I think it will pay dividends. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say it's going to change the trajectory of the overall returns of Goldman Sachs. Has it been, as we're investing in it, a drag on our ROE? Yes. But, you know, it's in a different stage of growth and development than our core businesses, and it really isn't 
the thing that affected our performance in the fourth quarter so, of the so year. So, David, a couple of years ago we were here and, uh, man, things were good. Things were percolating, cooking. And Paul Tudor Jones sat right there and said, yeah, but there's this coronavirus that, uh, you know, we don't know anything about it. It's over in China. Could mean something. Maybe not. Uh, it, it obviously meant something. Anything else right now that it's impossible to say what we what we don't know? How about debt ceiling? Does that smack us in, in the head? Or it's obviously hard to see things that, that you can't don't see. That you can't see, right? <laughs> but um, but what I would what I would say, Joe, on the debt ceiling, what I would say, and you know, I remember 2011 very well, as I know you do. Yeah. Um, you know, not good. You know, for us to go further and make this an issue. You know, in 2011, we didn't tip over, but we still had a downgrade. Downgrades have implications. I don't know what would happen if we tipped over, but I certainly don't want to test it. I think it would be a really bad thing, and I think the message should be clear. That's just not a good right. thing. And it's not like States. electing a speaker where you needed all those guys. Yeah, it, you only need a few. I mean, it would be very strange for, for those 20 guys I don't think can do the, the debt ceiling. That's impossible. You don't need many Republicans. I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to test it. It's not a good right. thing. But that was the, the, the quote was, there are people that like to watch the world burn. You've heard that. Uh, and, uh, I, I personally, I'm not one of them. <laughs> uh, finally, just on deal making, what you're actually seeing, because I feel like when there's lots of confidence, people make deals. Right now, there's not as much confidence. Um, do you think that's coming back? Do you think people are going to try, there's going to be a whole sort of restructuring component that hasn't happened yet? We, we keep hearing from CEOs who say we want to buy stuff. But in fact, Steve Schwartzman was here yesterday. He said, you know, you don't do it. You know, st the cycle's not over yet, meaning the, the downturn on the cycle. Yeah, piece. you know, deal making has slowed a little bit, but I, I point you to our M&A revenues in the fourth quarter and the relative performance of our M&A franchise. You know, we're still seeing good activity in our M&A franchise, but it's off the peak. You know, I think this is very correlated as you go forward. The refreshing of it in 2023 is very correlated to the discussion we were just having right. about, you know, the path of the economy. What's the path of the economy and how soft a landing do we have? The more dovish the scenario plays out, the better chance that, you know, that rejuvenates more quickly. You know, I do think we'll see more capital markets activity almost in any scenario in, in 2023. You know, my kind of historical lens on that is it takes four to six quarters to see people kind of get their head around the fact that the price is different. We had a very, very aggressive move up in stock prices and asset prices. And then an aggressive move down there. That's, that's so it's taking a little bit of time to reset. Yeah.